host today. Thank you so much for joining us and tuning into this virtual format, which allows us to continue to bring these awesome authors and their really important books to readers like you. And I am so excited to welcome our very special guest today, Debbie Levy, as we celebrate the release of her newest book, Photo Arc ABC. I'll put it in front of my face so you can see this awesome book. It's an animal alphabet in poetry and picture. Before we begin, just a few notes. If you'd like to have closed captioning for this event, please look at the bottom of your screen and click on the live transcript and then select show subtitle. If you haven't grabbed a copy of this awesome book yet, you can click the link that will drop in the chat to grab your own copies of Photo Arc ABC if you don't already or grab one for a friend. <laughs> also, if you have a question for a guest today, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and add one there. At the end of our chat, Jebby will have some time to answer your questions. You can also vote on questions you like and really want answered by clicking that thumbs up button at the bottom of your screen. And as always, please remember that this is a creative safe space and that we ask that friends be respectful of one another in their questions and comments. Also teachers, if you're sharing your screen today, please include the name, grade and school when adding student questions so we can give them a proper shout out. And of course, thanks again for joining us today and supporting such awesome books. So now on to the event we're all waiting for. It is my pleasure to introduce author and poet Debbie Levy. Welcome. Thank you, Leah. Yay. <laughs> Debbie has written many different books from fiction to nonfiction, poetry too, for many ages, but especially for young people. Debbie is a award-winning author of several books, including I Dissent, Ruth Bader Ginsburg Makes Her Mark, this Promise of Change, One Girl's Story in the Fight for School Equality, and Soldier Song, The True Story of the Civil War. Before she began writing books, Debbie worked as a newspaper editor and was also a lawyer here in Washington, DC. Yay, and she's local, of course. Along with writing, Debbie loves outdoors and enjoys kayaking, swimming, fishing in the Chesapeake Bay, and playing catch with or without a dog, her dog. So it is no surprise we are celebrating the release of her newest book, Photo Arc ABC. You can see it. Where she partnered with National Geographic and photographer Joel Sartori, the creator of Photo Arc, to create this fun and vibrant animal alphabet and poetry and pictures. So welcome, Debbie. Welcome to Politics and Prose Live. It's so Thanks, great Debbie. to have you this morning. Um, which it happens to be World Wildlife Day, which is a day to celebrate and raise awareness of the world's wild animals and plants. So now I'm gonna pass it over to you. Could you share with us a little about your amazing book? You bet I can. I would be happy to. Thanks to you, Leah. Thanks to Politics and Pros for having me. And thanks to um, those who are listening and watching. So I'm gonna jump right in. Time is short, right? And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to assume Lee is going to let me know if it's not shared. And um, talk with you for a bit, 15, 20 minutes, then come back to you for your question. So let's start with a poem. O is for octopus. Octopus squeezes where octopus pleases. Shape shifting, swim drifting, roaming every ocean, arms in constant motion, sucker studded, blue blooded, slime oozing, ink diffusing, tool using, coral cruising, octopus who pleases anyone who sees his boneless, brainy, squishy, squeezy self. As you heard from Leah, my book pairs poems that I've written with photos taken by National Geographic explorer, Joel Sartori. This is Joel, just to make sure everyone knows what National Geographic is, it's an organization that's all about the exploration of nature and of the many cultures of our world, and they're the publisher of my book. Now, about 15 years ago, Joel, who you see here behind his camera, decided that he wanted to take pictures of every type of animal in human care, meaning in, in zoos, in wildlife sanctuaries, refuges, preserves, places like that. 
he was thinking about the fact that most creatures aren't famous. You don't really know about them. Like giraffes and tigers are famous. And his idea was to get people to care about all critters, famous and not famous, big and little. So he takes his pictures as if the animals were in a photography studio, like when you have a school photo taken. So he uses plain black, black or white backgrounds like these and his photographs are all pretty close up. His method, and this is what he intends, is to make every animal about the same size in the picture. And he does it this way so that, say, a spider takes up the same space as is, is as important as the spider monkey, for example. They are equals. There are about 20,000 animal species in human care around the world. Not 20,000 animals, but species, which means a type of animal. So far, Joel has made portraits of 12,000 out of those 20,000, like these. He's got animals in the forest, in the desert, in the ocean, in lakes. Let's look at some of them up close, like this Sifaka, which I love the look of. Of course, I love the look of them all. This close up of a parrot. These monkeys, they're called red tailed monkeys. I know you can't see their tail, but you can see their heart shaped noses. This Tanzanian pink legged millipede, which is only about yay big, a couple of inches, maybe even that much. And you can see its pink legs. And here's one for you, the yellow eyelash pit viper. And Joel's gonna keep on taking pictures until he's got all 20,000 animals. So I loved writing this book. As Leah mentioned, it's not my first book. Here are, here are some of my others. But Photo Arc ABC was among my favorite books to write. Because the thing about these pictures that Joel took is that you really get right in the animals' faces. So you feel them, I felt them, as individual beings. And I love that feeling. You feel, or at least I felt, close to them as if we were family members almost. And who wouldn't want to be a family member with this woolly monkey? Now, sometimes it's not just their faces that you're close up with. Here's a face. Hey, little duckling, what did you do? What's that drop I see behind you? Oh, little mallard, that's part of life too. Not just a duck thing. It's what we all do. I think you know what that drop is. And that is one cute mallard duckling. But I wanted to make sure that we weren't focused in our book only on animals that most people think are cute or pretty. I wanted readers to appreciate animals that we may sometimes not even wanna look at, like vultures. Here are some of Joel's vultures. Now, when I mention vultures to adults, the reaction I usually get is they'll shudder and say, ugh, yuck, or something like that. Why? Well, as you probably know, vultures are scavengers. They feed off, they feed off dead animals that have been killed sometimes by other animals and left behind, or that have been killed accidentally by people, like when a deer gets hit by a car in the road. Vultures kind of gross people out. They swoop in and they eat that stuff up. I find that people also think vultures are ugly. So I had to have a vulture in my book. Here's the one we chose and the poem I wrote. Naked neck, bare head, beautiful bird. Beautiful. Bugs, bacteria, bits of food slip right off the naked bareness, leaving a crudless clean face. And that is Yes, that is beautiful, at least I think it is. And look, vultures don't harm us. They don't harm our pets. They don't harm the environment. In fact, vultures help all three of those things. Why? Because they eat up and make disappear dead critters that can otherwise be sources of disease. Why are they sources of disease? Because bacteria grow on dead stuff. So when you're next outside, Thank a vulture. 
But now, on to pandas, who are definitely cute and who don't eat dead animals. Alone is panda's way, a life of solitude. But not the cubs, their way is to cuddle. Well, another reason I loved writing the book, besides getting to spend time with these amazing pictures, is that part of the process of writing poems about the animals was to do research about them. I wanted to weave in interesting facts where possible. So in researching this panda poem that I just read, I learned that adult pandas are solitary. They want to be alone, to stay away from others. But young pandas are not this way at all. The baby pandas that you see here, the cubs, well, they just seem to love to cuddle with each other, as we see in this picture. I'm going to tell you a few other fun facts that are in the poems. You've already heard about the vulture, which you now love, right? We all now love vultures with the crud falling off of their face because they're naked. They have naked heads. Um, I learned that a grouper, a fish like this, goes through many changes in its fishy life, including, interesting to me, in many cases, a grouper changes from being female to male. That is, girl groupers frequently change into boy groupers and then stay that way for the rest of their lives. I learned about the octopus's ability to squeeze pretty much anywhere. So a 50 pound octopus, which is, you know, big, can fit through the smallest spaces, as small as this coin, about the size of a quarter. I also learned the octopus has blue blood, it oozes slime, and it can pick up and use tools. I learned that a newt, here you have one, can regenerate certain body parts, which means if it loses a foot, it grows back a new one. And I learned that the jellyfish doesn't have pretty much anything that we think of as a body part. Listen, no heart, no toes, no brains, no tongues, no eyes, no ears, no nose, no lungs, but water, yes, they're full of that, without which jellyfish are flat. No lungs, no nose, no ears, no eyes, no brain to make a jelly wise. No tongues, no toes, not even hearts. Nope, jellyfish don't need those parts. But as I found with every book that I've written, you just can't squeeze everything from your research between the covers of a single little book. So I end up with bits of information that I just carry around in my head with me. So if we meet one day in person, maybe I won't be able to help myself and I'll say something like, hey, do you know that a zebra baby recognizes the stripe pattern on its mother's rump, on its mother's butt? and finds its way around that way, it's true. The baby zebra sees what you're looking at right there, which is unique to its mother, and then it knows it's with its mom. Then it knows it's where it ought to be. Or I might say to you, did you know, because I didn't, that grizzly bears, which you may think of as slow moving, which I did, but they were slow moving because they're bulky and they're, they're big. How fast can something like that move? When they get running, they're two times as fast as the fastest human. Keep your distance from a grizzly. I now know, I learned that mallards, this type of duck, are the most common ducks on the planet. But before you start quacking about that, consider another fact that I learned, that it's only the female mallards who quack, males, make a quiet raspy sound. Of course, as you know, I chose to write about a mallard duckling pooping instead of a mallard duckling quacking. More facts about one of my favorite types of animals. I just love frogs, just love them. And I learned that they don't drink water. Rather, they absorb water through their skin. Also, a frog swallows its food. This is not a big pile of spinach. This is a frog. A frog follows, swallows its food with the help of its eyes. When the frog swallows, and you can imagine how this works, 
It closes its eyes. The eyes press down into the eye sockets, which are near the roof, the top of its mouth, and this helps moves the food down its throat. I thought you might want to see this guy close up. To me, as interesting as the fun facts that I and, and you can gather about the animals with whom we share the planet is the understanding that animals remain mysterious to us in many ways. For example, back to the zebra. Scientists can only guess about the reasons for the zebra's stripes. I know when I was growing up, we used to say, well, it's because it's for camouflage. We don't actually know that. Is it to help them regulate their body temperature? Maybe we don't know that either. To another black and white animal, the panda. Why is it black and white? Again, some people say, well, camouflage. But the panda has no natural enemies in the wild. That is usually an animal is camouflage to hide. An animal is hiding from predators who want to eat it. That's not, that's not what it's like for the panda in the wild. Do the colors help the panda adjust their body temperature? Does the pattern of the panda, scientists have asked, does, it, does that pattern signal to other pandas, hey, I'm a panda? It's a mystery. So just a reminder, there's still so much to discover about the creatures we share the planet with. And maybe some of the students who are watching, who are listening, maybe you'll be one of the ones to discover some of these, to figure out some of these mysteries about animals. So far, I've been talking about the animals. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the poetry. In writing the poems, I started usually by doing some reading about the animal, doing research, and then, and then daydreaming. Daydreaming is a very important part of writing. Just letting my mind wander around the information I'd gathered, around the animal's names, its appearance, really whatever came to mind. Sometimes the first thoughts I had about a poem stayed with me and became the basis for the poem. Like I knew I was gonna write a poem about the vulture being beautiful. Sometimes the first thoughts, which I was just sure were, they were gonna turn into the poem, got left behind. So for example, in my notes, I have a big green circle around a note that I, that I wrote that said, a newt in a suit. I was gonna write a poem about a newt in a suit. I like the rhyme, it's cute, but I ended up going in a different direction. Still, when you go to that poem, you can tell from the final poem that at one point, I was thinking about what a newt might wear if it wore clothes, including what it might wear on its feet. Here's that poem. Newts don't wear boots, but if they wore them and their boot wearing feet were lopped, if they tore them right off their legs, then what they would do is grow those feet back. They would, it's true, but those newly grown feet would not grow new boots because that is beyond the power of newts. I chose diverse, that is different poetic forms for this book to honor the diversity of the animal world. That is to honor the fact that there's so many different types of animals. Although I don't think there are 20,000 different types of poems. Some of my poems that I use rhyme, like the newt poem you just heard. Some are free verse, that is poems that don't rhyme and also that don't have a particular structure. Some poems don't rhyme, but do have a structure. So I'm gonna make this more concrete for you. Um, and I'm gonna talk about two of the poems in my book that have structure, a syncane for the panda. So here's my panda poem again, marked up. As I said, this poem is called a syncane. It has five lines, syncane, like, un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq in French, uno, dos, quatre, cinq. So you see where it, why it's called syncane. So five lines. The first line has two beats or syllables. The second line has four, then six, then eight, then two. So you go dot, 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 et cetera, et cetera, two, four, six, eight, two. Why did I choose this format? It wasn't for an entirely random reason. When I looked at the face of a panda, I saw five black smudges, two ears, two eyes, a nose. So I wanted to write 
a five line poem. I also like the idea of writing a poem that grew from two to four to six to eight. Also pandas stay with their mothers for up to two years. That's my two syllables. They leave at around four years, my four syllables. I'm not gonna tell you that I had reasons for six and eight. Honestly, this is not scientific stuff. I could have chosen a syncane for no reason at all, but often writers do have reasons, backstories for their choices. And that's my backstory for this poem. I could have chosen a different five line form of poetry known as a tenka, but I chose a tenka for my poem about hyenas. These are baby hyenas. Now, like vultures, which we looked at earlier, hyenas are scavengers. Like vultures, they feed on dead animals, often what's left over from what other animals have killed for their food. As in the case of vultures, people often say, yuck, about hyenas. They don't like them. Again, I say to those people, hyenas can do the ecosystems they live in a favor by eating bacteria infested dead animals. They don't harm the hyenas, but they would harm people and livestock like cows if they came in contact with them. So I wrote a poem as a sort of thank you note to the hyenas. After the big hunt, who will pitch in to clean up? Others eat and run, but hyena shows up late and puts away leftovers, puts away those leftovers in its mouth. A tanka, it, it's like a longer form of a haiku. It has five lines, syllables are five, seven, five, seven, seven. I've marked it up so you can see it. There was nothing magic about choosing. I didn't see something, I didn't see five when I looked at the hyena's face. Um, but I wanted to make my point about hyenas using few words, getting to the point quickly in plain language. So I chose a tanka. I'm gonna close here before I come back to you for any questions you might have with uh, the most challenging poem that I wrote. It's a form called the Reverso, which was invented by another poet whose books you may know named Marilyn Singer. This poem took me longer to write than anything else in this book. It's the last one in the book. What is a reverso? I can tell you after I read the poem, but looking at it, listening to it, maybe you can tell. And so I think the chat's going to be open for you to write in there after you hear it, what you see about this poem, why it might be called a reverso, what makes it special. If you can't figure it out, I'm also interested in what you might put in the chat about your favorite animals. They don't have to be in my book, just your favorite animals and why they're your favorite. Okay, here goes with the reverso. Spectacular creatures. We can be powerful or helpless, thoughtful or heedless, creative or destructive. Will we be protected or neglected? The fate of living beings is in human hands. The air we breathe, water, food, forests, grasslands are shared. Our habitats, our actions, so much depends on people. People, so much depends on our actions. Our habitats are shared. Water, food, forests, grasslands, the air we breathe. In human hands, the fate of living beings is protected or neglected. Will we be creative or destructive, thoughtful or heedless, powerful or helpless? We can be spectacular creatures. I am going to I'll keep that up for a minute while you take a look at it. Think about what I just read. We'll see if anybody puts in the chat what a reverso is, that is how it works. And I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing <clears throat> my screen and come back to you for your questions. And, um, and any comments. At least I think I am. Here we go.
I'm back. My phone won't stop ringing. Okay. Let me see if I've got anything in. <laughs> so anything in the chat. Kindergartens aren't sure. I can understand not being sure. So you know what? I'm going to go back to sharing it so you can see while I explain it, and then we'll go to your questions. No? Yeah, here we go. Here we go. So in a reverso, would it be the opposite of the first poem, Merch second grade asks? Yes. So if you look at the left side of the poem, spectacular creatures down to so much depends on people, that is from the animal's point of view, kind of worrying about, you know, we're spectacular creatures, so much depends on the people, and then discussing all the things that, that could affect them the way people affect them. On the right-hand side of the, of the page, that part of the poem is from the point of view of us, of people. I'm kind of shaking people and saying, people, so much depends on us. And then ending by saying, we too can be spectacular creatures. So that's what a reverso is. You read down and then you'll see that the second part of the poem is the same lines read upward, right? That's what a reverso is invented by the really brilliant Marilyn Singer. Okay, now I'm stopping sharing again. Yep, here's somebody else. Reversos when you use the same words in reverse order. So the same words are used in the second part of the poem in opposite order. We got it, I'm back. So I think we have some questions. Leah, will you help with the questions? It could be easier for you to see. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing about all your poetry and those amazing animals. Thank, and thank you friends and um, viewers for helping us figure out that virtuoso poem <laughs> and for you reading it aloud. Um, so we're gonna take some of your questions now, if you're ready. And also friends, we'll keep that chat open if you also wanna share some of your favorite animals still. And at the end, when we're done with your questions, maybe we'll share some of your favorite animals too, okay? How's that sound, Debbie? Sounds good. Let's do it. Okay, so now let's get to your questions. I see so many great ones in here. So let's start. With our first one, we have all of our friends from Miss Madeira's class that shared some great questions. So our first one is from Maceo, uh, Jared, and Gazin, kindergartners at Barnard, which would like to know, how did you find animals for the book? And how did you pick an animal to go with each letter? That's that's a really good question. It was It was not just my choice. In fact, it was mostly not my choice. Joel Sartori and the people who work with him and the people at National Geographic, they actually gave me a long list of animals that they thought they would want in the book. Um, and then we whittled it down from there. My role was to say, there are certain animals that I would really love to see. So the vulture, for example. Um, I'm trying to remember what other animals I really wanted to see. Um, well, uh, frogs, <laughs> because as I said, I really like frogs. So that's how it worked. It was a, it was, uh, it was a group decision, but I was really the small part of the group. Love that. Well, there are such amazing photos and your poetry went so well with them. So thank you so much. <laughs> um, our next Thank question you. comes from Nancy, um, also at Barnard, and An Nancy would like to know, do you have a favorite animal, and why is that your favorite animal? Because her favorite animal, or their favorite animal, is a dog. Oh. So we got our first favorite animal. Okay, well, I do love a dog, and my own dog is sitting here at my feet, under my desk, because that is her den all morning. Um, 
I, I mentioned that I really love frogs. Why? I think because they're so, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the frog picture in the book, in case you're wondering why I'm looking down. I, I think of it because they're so varied. Um, I also like the noises that, that they make. And um, actually this time of year is when my friend Karen and I um, go to CNO Canal Park, walk through, walk through the park. And when you get to these ponds, you hear the wood frogs just emerging from winter. So, so I guess frogs to me are also a sign of spring and I love them. Oh, what great timing. Yeah. And at home, I bet you all really wanna go on a nature hike now too. <laughs> look for frogs. Yes, look for frogs. Um, so our next one is from Leanne. And Leanne says, it's clear that you are comfortable speaking to an audience. Have you always been that way? Was there a learning curve for writing and talking about your writing? And oh another God. question, does an interesting topic about animals make it easier? I, um, I have never been comfortable talking to an audience. So thank you for saying that. When I was 13 at my bat mitzvah, I was so nervous that I left. I walked off of the bima, which is like the stage. Um, so it, it helps. What I've learned is that if you do something enough, pretty much anything, it gets easier. And it absolutely helps to have a book that, you, um, that you're excited about, that you love um, to talk about. Uh, so I would no longer walk off the stage. I'm comfortable, but it took me a long time <laughs> to get here. And what I've learned with this book, this is my second poetry book, is poetry is just, it might be the best thing to present, right? Because you can sort of bounce back and forth between reading poems, talking about the poems. Um, I guess I've mentioned a couple of times how much I love this book. <laughs> We do too. <laughs> um, our next question comes from Trinity, also um, a kinder at Barnard. Um, and they ask, how did you become an author and why? Um, I became an author because I love to read. And, and since I was a kid, I, I love to read. And when I was little, I, I, I made books, which I have here at home someplace um, that my mother kept all these years. Um, but then I went in a different direction. I, I went to law school. I became a lawyer. I practiced law for a while. I was always really loving writing. So I left law and went and became an editor at a newspaper. And that was great fun. I discovered that I also really love editing, but just gnawing at me to keep writing. And so, um, or I should say to start writing. And so I took a class at the writer center right here in, it's in Bethesda, Maryland. I took a class with the incomparable Mary Quattlebaum, who writers on, on um, who are here this morning may know. And, and that sort of opened up uh, my eyes and, and, I, and I worked hard at the, at the craft. And um, again, like learning how to speak in front of people, it, it took a while. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, our next one is from Davy, um, also Barnard. And Davy asks, how long did it take for you to finish this book? Oh, this book was on a kind of a fast track. So uh, I don't know exactly how, how long, but instead of sometimes these, you can work on a book, even a picture book with very few words, you can work on it for two years. I didn't have that amount of time and I'm glad I didn't. Probably I worked on the poems for, for six months, uh, you know, to get my editor like the first drafts of them, maybe a little less, um, but it was my pandemic project. It was, and I think that's why I'm, so, one reason I'm so enthusiastic about the book. I was so grateful to be able to have something to do writing poems during the last two years. It was the first half of the pandemic. Uh, it was just such a such a relief, such a retreat. And you know, you don't have to have a contract with the publisher 
in order to have that relief and retreat, any of you can also make time, take a little notebook, sheet of paper, sit quietly, gather your thoughts and write something down, whether it's poetry or, or a journal, but especially poetry. I, I really encourage everybody, kids here, adults too, to try their hand at writing poetry. As you can see, it doesn't have to rhyme. Well, I bet a, all these new poets are now born or we can't wait to hear your poems to already writing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, our next one is from Merch Second Grade and Merch Second Grade would like to know what kind of vultures were featured in your book. They wanna know what species you had in those pictures. Well, the one in the book, the one in the, in the book is a lappet faced vulture, which I had never heard of before. Um, and my understanding is that lappet, L-A-P-P-E-T, refers to like the side of its face. It's sort of like fake ears, I think, or, or folds of skin that look like the ears are called, are called lappets. The vultures that we mostly see around are turkey vultures. I'm sure everybody's seen a turkey vulture and sometimes we see black vultures around here as well. I'm so glad that those students are interested in vultures. <laughs> They're so cool. Uh, so everybody look out for those vultures. Yes. Um, our next one comes from Travis and Madeline also from our kindergartners at Barnard. Um, and they would like to know, what kinds of books do you like to read? I like to read, um, I read a lot of nonfiction, uh, although I also love novels and I continue to really like to read uh, picture books. I think that, uh, I hope that adults listening also occasionally will pick up a great picture book, their works of art um, and poetry often. And I step with, I, I read poetry a lot too. So basically I just told you that I read everything. I guess I read most everything except, I don't really read fantasy very much. Um, I like graphic novels too. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Those are all my answers to that question. <laughs> well, we all read widely. So I love all those kinds of books too. So our next question, a couple of our friends watching would love to know, including uh, Leanne and also we have Leomi. Um, from Barnard, will also like to know, you've written this book, what, what, what are you write, working on next? <laughs> <laughs> well, the very next book I have that will come out eventually, remember I said it can take two years for a picture book to come out. I, I, I have a picture book that's taking more like four years to come out. It's about something called The Friendship Train, which, which was a, a, a train that happened in 1947 after World War II, it ran from California to New York and all places in between, picking up donations from all kinds of Americans to send by ship to Europe where people were still suffering from World War II. Um, I'm not sure that's the best description of the book because the story is, is, is kind of better than that, but I, I, I'm excited about it because I love trains. Um, and I also love the idea of just people pitching in what they could, like lots of food, clothes, other things went over. And I'm working on a couple of other things that hopefully will, um, but I can't talk about them yet. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're so excited for that title and then we'll look out for those ones you can't talk about. Yeah, yet. the secret books. <laughs> yes, the secret books. Um, but we're still excited to see what's next. Thank you. Um, we still have some time for some more questions. So our next one is um, Enoch, also from Barnard. Um, and they ask, how did you become a good reader? I am learning. Oh, just, it's one of those things that if you keep doing it, you get better. You just do. Um, I went to my library, uh, my county library. I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland. And I went to the branch of the Silver Spring Library on Colesville Road every week and brought home a big stack of books and then brought them back and got, and got new ones. So 
it's it's not hard to always have a supply of books. I know we're talking here at a bookstore that sells books, but I know that even booksellers are really into telling people to use their public libraries. It's a great resource. So that's how I just kept doing it and doing it. What great advice. I love going to the library too. And I bet you friends listening love going too and also coming and visit us. <laughs> um, our next one is from Atali, um, also from a kindergartner from Barnard. And they asked, did you see all the animals in the book in real life? Did you get to see any of them? No, I didn't get to see any of them. I didn't. Joel travels all over the world. Like at the very back of the book, it tells you where different animals are from. So um, here is the butterfly from Australia, the lappet-faced vulture, parts of Africa and Asia, that sifaka, sort of the monkey looking one on the reverso poem from Madagascar. No, I didn't go to any of those places. I just, I just looked at the pictures. <laughs> Oh, it's such a beautiful book. And you didn't mention that after all of if any of friends who have the book at home, if you've gone to the back of the book, I love how also there's a list of all of the animals that are mentioned. And we also get to see kind of which ones might need our help too. Right. So right. thank you so much for sharing it. and all those friends, you can check out all the different kinds of animals in the back. Yes. You get to see them at the zoo. Um, our next one is from um, is from Carol, and Carol asks, "I know that the relationship between an author and an illustrator or photographer is so important. Can you describe how you and Joel work together?" Yes, I can describe that. We didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and you know, sometimes when it's not a photographer, when it's an artist making illustrations. Again, sometimes the author and illustrator actually frequently don't work together there either. Why is this? You know, people are often surprised by this, but each of us has our role in the book. And um, whether it's Joel, the photographer, or somebody who's, who illustrated one of my picture books, that person has a creative freedom to do what he's bet does best. Take pictures, draw pictures. I have creative freedom to do what I do best, um, write stuff. In between us is an editor and usually an art director, a book designer. And it's not like we can never talk to each other, but it though it sounds a little strange, it makes sense to have this separation. Um, it sometimes it sometimes there are exceptions and authors and illustrators work together closely, but my experience is there's usually a separation. Um, and that way you don't have the author telling the illustrator or the photographer, hey, you know, if this were just a little bit more whatever I might think, you don't have them saying, Debbie, you know, uh, I don't think the tanka is the best form of poetry there. I think you should use a sonnet. No, no, we don't tell each other that. So Carol, that's how it worked in this book and for me in, in most of my books. Well, um, we have time for one more question. So our last question is, um, where did it disappear to? <laughs> <laughs> um, and this one is uh, from Carter a kindergartner at Barnard as well. And they asked, how did you make the words on the pages look so pretty? I oh. Because poetry, where you put the words is so important. How I, I, I love that Carter noticed that. Um, and this is one of those things that was not my choice or my doing. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. But you know who knows how to do that? He's a book designer. So the book designer did that, um, we did have a conversation. They asked me, what would you be okay if we did creative things with the words and you know, like they do here and, and didn't just place them 
straight on the page. And I said, yes, I would be very okay if you did that. And, and so there you go. So Carter, I didn't do that, but uh, there's a job called being a book designer. And that's the sort of thing that those people do. So many different friends that went into making this awesome book. Thank yes. you, Debbie, for so much for sharing. Sadly, that's all the time we have yeah. for questions. Um, I just wanted to end on one little question just to leave us off with this thought. Um, my question is, I really loved how uh, one time I heard Joel Sartori describe the photo arc project as a voice to the voiceless. How do you feel that this work kind of adds to this conversation? What do you want to leave readers with reading it? A sense of, of, of caring about animals that you don't even know, that is that you, you, you may never see in your life, but that are out there living in various places. Um, in a sense that we're responsible as the Reverso poem reminds us for how we treat our ecosystems, which is where our animals live, and therefore we're responsible for how they do. And they're living beings just like we are. Um, and so I, I, I hope it adds to this conversation of thinking about how we, um, how we can live in the world without, without harming the other creatures that that share the earth with us. Thanks for mentioning that, Leah. Thank you so much, Debbie, for sharing that. It's so important. This is such a fun book, with such a great message, and I hope that friends really enjoy it. Sadly, that's all the time we have. Um, thank you, Debbie, so much for joining us this morning and sharing your words and insights in this awesome book. And viewers, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for your comments and all the questions you shared and for tuning in, especially from our classrooms, um, from Barnard and Merch. Thank you for being here. Don't forget, you can still click on that link to grab your copy of <laughs> ABC and have that for your classroom or home, uh, as well as check out Debbie's other amazing books and you'll learn so many other important things too. Um, of course, as an independent bookstore, we really appreciate your support in supporting these amazing voices. Um, you can find out about more events um, by checking out our website for updated listings. You can also follow our children and teen department on social media at Kids and Pros, um, and we'll also drop that in our chat box. Um, and you can also check out our past events just like this one on our Politics and Pros YouTube page. You can watch this one again. Um, and again, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you all keep reading widely, expanding your world, exploring new ones, and thinking about how we can help the environment. Um, happy World Wildlife Day. I hope you